Great. Hey, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to Graham being the MC, but it's it's nice to have our own Top Gun uh, make the introductions for us. So, um, I don't know if you can advance the slide, too. Fantastic. So it was about just about a year, Tom, since we did the last one. And in our last demo presentation to the IWPC members, and first of all, uh, thank you for attending. I really appreciate everybody's uh, time uh, this morning, afternoon, or evening. Um, so about a year ago, we did our last presentation, and we showed uh, deployment of 5G uh, core and RAN on bare metal, and then deployed services on top of that, and exposed that to uh, customers through a portal where they could then uh, order services over the 5G RAN network, which was uh, pretty exciting. And that, that demo in the deck is in the IWPC library, as Tom mentioned, from last year. Uh, this year, we're going we're gonna to take it another step further. We're constantly, constantly building since, uh, since running Etsy NFE POC number one in 2013, and then uh, Etsy Zero Touch Network and Service Management POC in 2016. Uh, we're constantly looking to, you know, be at the frontier of uh, telco virtualization and automation. So this year, uh, we're doing Intel 5G testbed. We're really excited about this. It's, it's a great collaboration. It's a multi-vendor uh, project. Uh, it's called Extreme Automation at the Edge, and we're going to be demonstrating it to you today. The scenario this time is programmable networking. So we're going beyond bare metal, we're going beyond the compute storage, and uh, down into the NICs. Uh, and uh, we're going to be showing uh, dynamic configuration of the NIC. The use case will be one that everybody is probably familiar with, SD-WAN SASE. Um, again, we're really pleased with the uh, partners that we have for, uh, for the demo. Uh, so I think you'll see a really strong showing collectively uh, for this demonstration. So in short, it's a multi-vendor solution demonstrating dynamic configuration of Intel's latest Columbiaville NICs to optimize processing of secure NICs. I'm Dave Dugal, I'm the founder and CEO of Enterprise Web, and I'm joined, as you can probably see in the box, uh, Bill Malk, he's uh, still sharing his screen there, yeah. our chief system architect. He's going to actually do the live demo. So, uh, next slide, Paul. So, as you can see, we have a, a big agenda here, and you'll be pleased that almost all of it's demo. So, uh, I'm going to set up the demo uh, with some slides, you know, concrete slides relative to uh, the use case, walk you through that so you know what you're going to see. Uh, then Bill's going to actually walk you through those use case uh, uh, steps. Uh, he's going to essentially show you a catalog with all the solution elements uh, onboarded and how they got onboarded and the nature of their mappings to our system. He's going to then show you a declo uh, declaratively composed and pin-based network service. Uh, and and so sort of give you an idea of how that was composed and how you put on your SLAs and service chain and the policies. Uh, once that service is together, it's going to be, uh, uh, we're going to receive an order for the service. We're going to deploy it. It's all automated. Um, Bill's going to walk you through that step. The system will have generated, uh, when you declare to Blue Combo as a service, the system's going to generate a deployment plan. And then when the service is ordered, it's going to execute that deployment plan. And Bill will walk you through that from day one. And then day two, Bill's going to walk through a, a few scenarios uh, that were supported by uh, Keysight, uh, which is providing simulation uh, testing uh, for this uh, uh, test bed. And so uh, Bill will walk through a couple of uh, clear scenarios so you can see uh, the power uh, of the solution. And then he's going to go right into the numbers. We've actually done extensive uh, reporting on this, documentation, benchmarking, and uh, we're going to show how uh, such a solution is uh, secure, performant, and energy efficient. Uh, next slide, Bill. So uh, before going to the use case, let's uh, introduce the team. Uh, Red Hat is uh, providing its OpenShift uh, infrastructure management. Also, they're big supporters of uh, Prometheus, uh, and we'll be featuring that here as well in this uh, uh, presentation. We're using uh, Fortinet. Fortinet is also supporting the project with its Fortigate uh, SD-WAN and SASE. We have Keysight's uh, Cypher uh, test agents, which is providing uh, testing and uh, simulation, so it's receiving Providing, generating loads for us, traffic, uh, as well as uh, its test agents. And we have uh, KX, which is not going to be featured in this stage in today's demo, but is, is set to be in the next uh, phase of this uh, test bed. And they're going to be providing advanced uh, data services and analytics. Um, 
We, of course, couldn't have this test bed without Intel. It's providing the test bed environment and the Columbia Gold Mix, Intel. And then Enterprise Web, our company, if you don't know us, uh, we provide Cloud NFV, which is intelligent orchestrator. So it's providing end-to-end -end orchestration, SMO capabilities, LCM, lifecycle management capabilities, and integration uh, platform capabilities, all in a cloud-native, edge-optimized 50 megabyte footprint that's fully distributable. So uh, Enterprise Web will be facilitating the overall end-to-end -end service. The test bed, as I'm, I think I mentioned, also includes Prometheus and, I'm sorry, and Grafana. We're also featuring the ONF's uh, Aether uh, project, which is their SD core and SD RAN. So all of those things will be uh, shown in the demo. Next slide, please. So this is the test bed service topology. Here you can see all the actors uh, involved. So you can see uh, SciPerf, uh, on the far left, providing the simulation, uh, as well as Cypher, and sort of the uh, sort of middle on the right there, providing the test agents. At the top, you can see that the environments, both the edge site and the core site, are supported by RHEL and OpenShift. Uh, at the bottom, you can see there's the ONF SD core and ONF SD RAM. Uh, on the bottom right, Prometheus Grafana. And uh, at, in sort of towards the middle, the middle left, you can see the Fortinet, the SD WAN and the Fortinet uh, secure gateway as well. So all the players, and this will all be very clear, we will walk through everyone's role uh, inside the, the test bed, and you'll see, of course, see the end-to-end -end operation. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give a little bit of context. Now, many of you are probably familiar with programmable networking, um, and but even if you, you're, you've been following uh, the movements with the ONF and P4, et cetera, I highly recommend this talk from just last week. So when I was putting together these slides, uh, it was a great benefit to me that I stumbled on this uh, recording of this talk, and it's available now on YouTube. And there's the link if you want to screenshot that right now and enter that later, but you probably can just look it up, ONFP4 Workshop 2022. And it was a keynote by Nick McEwen and Sacha McCarty and Bruce Davey, uh, and they did such a great job of walking through sort of the motivation for programming network, programmable networking, uh, the history of it, the challenges and stumbling blocks, uh, as well as the future. So I really recommend that as sort of the context for this slide, but also just background on programmable network in general. To sort of summarize it, and also to show this test bed's alignment with this presentation just last week, uh, I got some bullets on the right-hand side there. So uh, you know, programmable, the motivation for programmable networking is, of course, to hand over control of the packets, right? The whole idea is to empower operators uh, so they have direct control of the programmable silicon and open APIs. And the end goal of that is that the, these APIs empower developers and enable innovation. Even things that Nick McEwen point out, these are even things that we can't anticipate. Just much like the internet was an enabling technology and the web were enabling technologies for things that couldn't have been anticipated at the time, um, like say Facebook and, and et cetera, right? Now, uh, programmable networking will uh, empower use cases like we're going to show today, uh, but also a, a brave new future, uh, you know, um, or telcos, or you know, streamlined automated uh, telecom operations. Uh, one thing that's interesting that they point out, uh, I think it's uh, Satch and Kati that points it out, is that vertically integrated software stack, in other words, the traditional way that software is deployed in, you know, vertically integrated uh, uh, software with lots of middleware components that's been done for the last couple of decades, it didn't really work that well in service orientation and it's, it's really struggling in sort of this cloud native microservice event-driven world. It's just not gonna support the increased dynamicity uh, and agility required for 5G edge computing um, that's being envisioned here. So what they, what they say is the future, and they say it's inevitable on the edge, is that there's going to be a horizontal platform. If you want consistent, composable, end-to-end -end network services, you're going to need horizontally architected platform. platforms that are not tightly coupled vertically integrated stacks, but horizontally organized so that they can scale elastically, be extended readily, and have reusable common services that can be uh, shared across different use cases and verticals. In other words, platforms that could be deployed at all of your edge customer sites where you have a common baseline platform that can be easily configured per customer while maintaining a common core foundation. 
course, that uh, platform needs to be performant and agile. You're going to see this in the demo today. But it also needs to be, uh, it also should demonstrate that it's green. Uh, and, and green uh, both by intention, uh, in other words, purposely being sustainable, but also just by nature of having to run efficiently at the edge, you need to be able to do more with less, right? It's a discipline. The edge is uh, in, uh, going to drive, uh, you can't be sacrificing capabilities at the edge because uh, then you're just going to be round tripping to the core all the time uh, you, and adding latency back into your processes. What you want to be able to do is push as much uh, processing as possible to the edge. So you have to be able to do more with less. Next slide, please. So in the demo today, uh, Bill's going to uh, show you what we did in advance. So we could obviously do everything in the 30 minute demo. Uh, you're gonna see the environment that we deployed on. Um, I think it's a Google GCP environment. You're gonna see OpenShift with uh, Prometheus Grafana deployed um, with uh, RHEL uh, on the Intel hardware, RHEL uh, running for the edge of the core. Enterprise web, our cloud and a V solution is gonna be deployed via an OpenShift operator. We're actually a certified actually REL8 certified and we're a certified Red Hat uh, CNF. And we have a, a Red Hat operator as well. So we're gonna be deployed by OpenShift as if we were a CNF. And that's gonna put our platform out at the edge. Um, the Cyperf uh, controller is gonna be deployed to the core in KVM. So essentially outside of the network for testing purposes. And then we're gonna have all the solution, el all the other uh, solution elements uh, you know, onboarded model Standard interfaces, are going, standard base interfaces are going to be generated. Red Hat operators are going to be generated, and they're all going to be registered in the catalog. And that's going to be the basis for the service composition, for the declarative service composition. Uh, Bill will then compose a, uh, show you a composed service, uh, how it's all connected, how it was all done with just metadata. He's going to show you essentially the limited effort that is required. Right, you're just going to define the business logic, right, the service chain policies, the SLAs, etc. You don't, you don't have to tell an intent-based system, you know, uh, it's infrastructure independent, it's protocol agnostic. You don't have to tell it how to integrate itself. You don't, you don't have to manually do anything point to point. Uh, the system will resolve all those dependencies at runtime. So the platform is gonna generate a deployment workflow, uh, and then uh, day two, it's gonna handle, it's essentially gonna enforce all of the policies uh, that were uh, part of the business logic. And then, um, uh, that, that's it. If we can go to the next slide, Bill. So, as far as the deployment plan, uh, the system is going to generate this deployment plan. It's going to be essentially a single plat uh, platform based workflow uh, that's going to be executed as soon as there's an order for the, uh, for the service. And it, this way the enterprise web works is essentially we use things that are very generic so they can be reusable and contextualized on a per service or per object basis. So in this case, there's a very logical process and at stage one, two, and three, you know, we're gonna establish infrastructure, we're gonna instantiate the service, and configure the services uh, to run together. Um, and uh, that was sort of that high level sort of like business process world, you might call that a three byte kebab. It's, it's very logical gates that everyone can understand at a generic level, high level, that would have to be done to uh, instantiate such a complex service. Of course, the details will vary. So what happens is when we generate this workflow, the system looks at the participating elements of the service design, it looks at all of the policies, it looks at the constraints, the affinities, the anti-affinities, it looks at the protocols, formats, you know, schemas, et cetera, of all of the participants, and it generates that, uh, that workflow plan. Uh, and then it executes it in, uh, as, as, in as much a parallel fashion as possible. Uh, and then sequential as necessary. So the whole thing executes and it's transactional. So if any one of these stages fail, the whole service fails. You can't have a partially deployed service with elements deployed, but not the whole service running. So it's very critical that this not only be uh, done in a zero touch basis, uh, that it's done completely automated, but it's also that it's done in a way that's reliable and trustworthy, right? We need to know that this is fully assured if at any point this uh, uh, deployment fails for whatever reason, we need to roll back all the, uh, uh, whatever's been deployed to date and report back that failure um, so it can be addressed independently. And that's on the deployment. Next, next slide, Bill. So uh, Bill's gonna walk through these. I just wanna give you a, a quick 
uh, summary of the day two operations that we're going to demonstrate. So, that, you know, at first we're really just showing that there is sort of a high level control plane, right? Enterprise web, um, consistent with the goals of uh, programmable networking, is providing this high level application layer control plane that is coordinating and configuring all of the solution elements here without any third party tools or elements, right? We're all, only talking about the critical elements of the business use case. And we've sort of gotten rid of that sort of bloated middleware stack. We're getting rid of that sort of unwieldy cloud native tool chain, providing sort of a unified abstraction, uh, you know, with common tools, just as described uh, by uh, Nick and Keith in that keynote. Uh, next slide. So uh, once that Bill shows you that, then he's going to show you everything's deployed and it's running, and then we're going to use Cyperf uh, to simulate a bad actor, which is going to feed that, uh, traffic uh, through the system, and which is going to be detected by uh, Fortigate, and the system is going to mediate against that. Uh, next. We're going to do then another related scenario where uh, Cyperf uh, actually just increases the volume of traffic to show the impact of uh, you know, load, you see the system uh, running under load and how it scales up. So that you can see sort of zero touch, self healing, scaling, optimizing. Next slide. And then in the next stage, what we're not gonna show uh, this time, we couldn't fit it in in the time allowed, and we'll do it in a subsequent demo, is uh, SON signaling. All uh, right, uh, our partners, uh, KX, are gonna provide their data, the low latency, high performance uh, data services and analytics. They're going to provide observability and AI ML integration for this test bed. And that's going to give us sort of an advanced SON signaling capability. And we're going to sort of um, you know, take all this sort of uh, wider evaluation of state <clears throat> to further optimize uh, test bed performance. Uh, and I believe, Bill, that's it for me. Yep. So I'm going to switch it to you now, Bill. Okay, yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, Dave, can I ask a couple uh, quick questions while, while we're here? Um, so my understanding is, um, I, I know you can't disclose who, but this system is now in, in production with a tier one operator, correct? So it, uh, you know, uh, so of course we've got some illustrious partners here and of course their solutions have been in production for a long time. Enterprise Web itself is, like you said, we're in production with the leading tier one, one of the largest in the world. Um, this test bed is running inside Intel right now, and Intel is offering uh, trials. And of course, we're going to offer uh, you know, uh, private demos for telco operators. They can just uh, text us or email, email me after the event. We can set up either a private demo and or a trial. So uh, Intel is going to be promoting this multi-vendor integrated solution in their solution, uh, in their INB marketplace. So we're actually really excited about this. They saw, they're, of course, very happy. This test bed is demonstrating dynamic configuration of their Columbiaville mix. So uh, there, and since we've demonstrated it, documented, shared all of our testing data internally, uh, they're very ha uh, happy to be promoting this as a solution inside their INB marketplace. So yes, yes thank you. This okay. is this is running. Cool. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, self-healing. So if one of these modules, um, you know, crashes during the thing, it'll respawn the thing and, and keep running? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it's the whole, the whole solution is cloud native. Enterprise web itself is cloud native. Uh, it's deployed for HA high availability, right? And uh, if it goes down, if, since it's stateless, it can be uh, restarted very quickly, redeployed. It acts like it's a cloud native function, really, right? Um, so it has all the attributes of being uh, cloud native, and then it's, since it has such a small footprint, 50 megabytes, it's uh, you know easy and very quick to deploy. Uh, the whole solution is meant uh, set up to be resilient, and you're going to see that as Bill actually walks. In. This is a live demo. We try we try never to do canned demos. This will actually will be running live operation for you. So it's not going to be a video, um, and so you're going to see those operations. He's going to run the scaling operation. He's going to run a DDoS attack against this, uh, the system, and Bill's going to show you exactly what happened. Or are you going to even run it one time without policies in place, and we're just going to let the system fail, just so you can so you can actually see that scenario that you just described? And then we're going to turn on the policies, and we're going to show you how the self system self heals. Okay. All right. And one more uh, dumb question here, and I'll, I'll let you guys get back on with it. But I was, I was just curious when I was looking at this. How would this work in like a network slicing environment? Um, 
does it kind of run over the top of that or does each slice need to do that? How does that work? So uh, so actually we're using slicing here. So this is a 5G uh, you know, edge test bed and uh, slices uh, are part of our demonstration. So uh, we are actually controlling it per, per slice. And uh, I think Bill will actually be stepping through that a little bit as well. All right. Manage or slice management as well. And, and that's the really sort of the beauty of the system. So what happens is the telco environment is, or, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, the telco environment was complex, right? Anybody would agree it was complex. As it went to the cloud, it became more complex. As it goes to the edge, right, it becomes exponentially even more complex. And the problem is uh, you don't want your tools and your solutions to add accidental complexity. You want, you want your solutions to get out of your way. So things like slice management would become a new element of this future, you really want this to be part of a horizontal platform where all those kind of capabilities could just be added on horizontally as opposed to building a bigger and bigger and bigger stack. So slice management is absolutely part of the, uh, of the presentation and, um, and we're, going to we're going to cover it all. We, we really want people to see it for themselves. This is, we're always demonstrating what is possible today. It might look future forward, but it, it's all real okay. and it's all in production. Great, thanks. And just a quick reminder, if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, just type them into the chat box. So looking forward to your demo. Great, thank, thank you. you. Tom, uh, Bill, take it away. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so appreciate your time, everybody, and uh, your attention here. It's really exciting to be presenting to you. Uh, so for the demo, as Dave stated, I'm gonna really uh, spend about 30 minutes walking through the use case, and you'll see about you know, a, a little bit of time spent on just what, what it is we put together. So I'm gonna show you the catalog itself, all the solution elements, and I'm just gonna to touch on a little bit about how they map up to our domain model, which really makes the sort of, uh, we call it, you know, almost the magic that people talk about possible, right? It's the metadata that drives all the connections and automation that you're gonna see. Uh, then I'll show you how I take advantage of that. I'll show you this uh, service that we're going to deploy and how simply I'm really just picking out of that catalog, uh, specifying a couple of things like policies and so on. Um, and then I'm letting the system really glue this thing together for me, do it in a zero touch manner. We'll explore how it deploys. Uh, we'll look at it. Um, uh, and just to be very clear for the demo itself, when I'm deploying all the components, they come with you know, the, the policy sort of turned off for scaling. And just to be very clear, all the components will deploy. Um, but what you'll see is a service that, you know, runs and it's all, it's great until an attack comes or load comes and it needs those policies. So for day two, what you'll see is I'll simulate a bunch of attack traffic uh, and then I'll show you what the service looks like once it's, you know, degraded, right? Once the attacks start hitting. And then I'll show you the benefit of turning these optimizations on one at a time. And then when I'm finally finished all that, I'm going to come back to a couple of slides and review some of the benchmarks and everything for you. So, um, so just to start, though, before we, we get into anything else, as David mentioned, we deployed this thing into the test bed. So what's deployed and what we're going to be working with. So I'll just very quickly show you, right? So what I've stood up is uh, a couple of things for demo. So we have a version of OpenShift running. It's a sandbox right now for the actual demo itself. Um, but this is full across, you know, I think it's uh, five nodes that are standing up inside the Intel test bed itself. Um, and then uh, the SciPerf agent, uh, the uh, key site components are deployed on one of the uh, standalone servers there. So it's outside of the network path and everything else, but it's already been deployed. Um, and then you have a version of Enterprise Web. It's running out on uh, Google Cloud right now and it's connecting into the test bed. Uh, but already, uh, as I think we'd, we'd mentioned at the outset, um, we have uh, deployed uh, the Microsoft, or sorry, um, the Enterprise Web uh, controller uh, using one of the uh, OpenShift operators. So it's sort of the only thing, if you want, that's actually been deployed into the test bed network. And I can just refresh you here and show you, you know, you're going to see this thing uh, as we start to deploy components and everything else. You'll see the operators and the components themselves all, you know, eventually get deployed. Um, we have that, um, uh, that deployment of enterprise web, as I mentioned, it's a set of cloud native pods uh, that are all deployed over OpenShift themselves. They do all the kind of uh, web scaling that you'd expect and all that kind of good stuff. So, well, with that said, I'm going to actually explore our catalog a little bit and show you uh, some of the components that have been uh, modeled and then how they map up to uh, the uh, domain model that we have that makes the automation possible. So I'm just logging into uh, what we call our application manager. Uh, it's one of the modules that's used for onboarding the various solution elements. Um, it provides a whole bunch of tooling that makes this really easy. So someone can start with 
a VNFD or a YAML file or something like that, uh, upload it into the system and start the onboarding where the system will map all the uh, elements that are in there into what is really our sort of harmonized model for you know, supporting any one of these elements. I'll drill into them in a second, but what you see here is that overall catalog with all the solution elements. So I can search for something like there's a KX component, for instance, there's the video streaming component, um, there's our firewall, um, the Fortinet firewall, and any other ones that we may have uh, uh, modeled previously in Enterprise Web here. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just jump into a couple of them to show you a little bit of the variety that's it's inside. We have this video host. It's a really simple um, CNF. It was quite literally something that I just took a um, YAML descriptor for, and the system was able to map that into something that was, you know, our, our sort of VNF descriptor that's at a very high level. It, you know, I'm really specifying what is sort of a minimum viable description of, of information for how to deploy this thing. And then the systems will rely on, and I'll show you the models in a second, all the metadata that we have that says what it means to be a container, you know, that... And then down the line, what that means if we deploy it to vanilla Kubernetes versus OpenShift, the system works those out and the optimization's available and deploys you know, whatever the component is. This video host happened to be something very simple. It's just an HTTP interface and it's just one you know, uh, VNFC, right? It's just a simple container that's gonna be in there with a CLI to manage it. Uh, if we contrast this against the Aether component, right, which was the, um, Open, uh, sorry, the open source uh, component we brought in from the ONF for doing all the core and RAN, you're going to see the package for this is much more, uh, you know, <laughs> much more complex, right? It's a composite VNF. It's got, you know, tons of VNFCs, uh, the components that are all going to be running here. Um, you know, all of them, of course, are containers and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, below this, we have uh, a bunch of properties, behaviors, and so on that we're going to be specifying for these components. And really like specifying a few things like cluster sizes and so on, we can have some automatic scaling going on for these components that enterprise web itself will you know, sort of automatically kick in, play the role of VNFM. And then interfaces like the SGI, um, uh, the actual management interfaces, all I have to do is really point the system at what these kind of uh, protocols are gonna be. And then what I get is this kind of overall package that describes both how I can operate with this thing, right? So through the management interfaces, we can use Enterprise Web as a VNFM to you know, do the instantiation, all the lifecycle management. And then at that lower level, we have things like references to 3GPP. So the system can understand what those, um, you know, the actual protocols are going to be, right? So the operation of the, of the service as well. So both of those, as I mentioned, come from our, um, our meta model, right? So I'm, I'm going to just log into a different component here. And just very for demo purposes, I just want to show you what these models look like. All right, so uh, this is uh, something that an architect would normally work with or someone who's managing things like the standards that are behind this. So within here, what I have is the end-to-end -end enterprise web domain model, which actually has all the concepts to support uh, distributed systems at large, right? It's a, you know, it's a pretty complex, or well, it's a pretty rich uh, graph right here. If you look at it, everything from you know, VNS down to uh, all kinds of things that I'm sure you're all used to. BGP uh, sort of concrete uh, elements of this, nodes like VMs and containers, there's protocols, formats, you can see, you know, Yang, XML, et cetera, all the, basically all the kinds of components that are needed for systems at large. And then we supplement that with things like concepts from 3GPP, TM4, MEF, et cetera. So we're supporting interoperability in our, you know, basically you take that minimum viable or relaxed constraints, our system maps them up to this so that we can start to talk about them in terms that are either domain specific or standard specific. For instance, the Red Hat domain here, we do a lot with um, uh, things like uh, OpenShift itself, of course, but then things like the OpenShift operators. There's a graph the system can walk for me to understand or for the system itself to understand when I say that this thing is gonna be deployed on OpenShift, how I might be able to go about doing that. And one of the benefits of what we actually do here in the test bed is that we wrap every one of those components you saw me uh, just reference in that application manager. We wrap everyone with an OpenShift operator so that it can be you know, managed in a sort of nice sort of um, consistent way within OpenShift and take advantage of their optimizations. It's just, if you want, it's just a benefit of our model here that you get by basically combining the model we have. The, uh, yeah, yeah, Bill, I'm just gonna interject for a quick second is, and the whole point of this is we're showing is a graph connected telco operational model. And the whole benefit of this model being the system is ready to use. <clears throat> and 
the benefit of the mapping is that everything is done in metadata and it enables uh, heterogeneous uh, solution elements, right? Uh, vendor proprietary CLI, uh, diverse uh, APIs, it allows vend uh, vendors whose products might not be 100% standard based, might not be consistently designed, uh, and it allows them to um, uh, conform to the standards without changing their interfaces. In other words, Enterprise Web's model is going to mediate the relationship uh, between the onboarded partner elements and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm here, the onboarded partner elements and the standards. So the standards are essentially being enabled at a higher level of abstraction. And that actually supports, or, or the reality is that not all vendor products are standard, uh, or not all, all standards. We're not consistently representing the standards, um, or fully representing the standards. And then the standards themselves are evolving. So to overcome those interoperability challenges where you have standards that, discrete standards from separate standards bodies that are constantly evolving, uh, plus you have you know, vendors who pro whose products are uh, you know, diverse and have innovation in them, et cetera. <clears throat> and you want them all to participate in your services. So what you want to do is abstract the, uh, the sort of standards, you know, have an abstracted model where all of the solution elements can interact via the model without any point to point integration. And <clears throat> Bill's just showing you sort of the graph connected models. Let's get back to the demo Bill. Yep, so now I'm going to actually go to the second um, <clears throat> part, point of the, uh, the demo itself, which is to look at the actual compo compo uh, composed service. So I'm gonna show you basically how I took advantage of all of the richness. Oh, sorry, I gotta make sure I'm secure here. Um, so how I took advantage of all the richness that was actually modeled in each of those uh, application elements. So you're looking at a catalog here. I'm, I'm in a slightly different um, place, right? I'm playing the role of a service manager, or sorry, a, a service designer, and I'm actually just logging into our module that's, that's built for that kind of composition management and so on. So I have a network service that's actually been uh, composed within the system here. So it was created in a similar way to the kind of onboarding. It's just that now what we're talking about is really a template for you know the service um, itself that's going to be deployed and this supports slicing and everything else so I'm just going to jump right to the point that's actually the um, the interesting uh, piece here all I had to do uh, and I think it was stated a number of times here was select the components that I wanted sort of compose the service chain and then start answering the you know, declarative level questions about them and attaching any policies for me to realize this service so uh, you saw it depicted in a bunch of different ways here, but really all I did was look at that catalog and pick out the components I just showed you, right? All the lower level detail about something like the Aether stack, et cetera, that was gonna be pulled in here. Um, I was able to specify a few things. We talked about slicing earlier. We're just saying, you know, the video host is gonna be per slice and the system will determine things like, you know, is the core that's shared between the slices. Like I don't wanna have to specify that in my service. I just wanna have to specify at a high level what the components actually are. And of course, as I'm doing the composition, there are uh, options here for me to, you know, search those catalogs and start uh, you know, uh, binding this thing together. But I picked my, my components and I could drill in on any of them. And if I wanted, I could specify things like some affinities and so on if, if I need to, uh, and any custom policies that might be attached to these. And I really, in this case, minimum viable, I just took the components that were onboarded and attached the additional policies to them. So I picked my hosts, I picked whatever else. Um, in this case, I combined them all here into my simple service graph. Uh, and for any one of these, I can specify, of course, you know, the service chaining policies I might want to apply in between. You know, there are no policies right here, but as I want to start working with it, I can add models to it. You know, a gold class might only enjoy a certain, um, you know, a connection. I might have a 50% traffic, the kind of like, you know, testing sort of, uh, you know, the, the, all the kinds of service chain policies you might want here are going to be supported. Um, so, but I, I specify them again at a high level or as low as I need to go for, you know, to meet my, uh, the demands of my use case. Um, I've got those services uh, created and then all I did was attach a couple of policies uh, for um, things like maintaining the quality of what was actually going to be pushed across the channel. Now, the, the thing here that's important, right, and I, I, it can be uh, you know, lost if, if I go too quickly is, as I was doing this, um, the system in the background was, of course, navigating that graph, connecting all the metadata and figuring out how to deploy this thing. Well, it constructed for me literally a, a deployment plan, right? So underneath the instantiate operation here, what I can actually see is what this process model or high-level plan looks like. 
which starts out with, of course, establishing the infrastructure, um, actually standing up the elements that are going to be in the, the uh, solution, configuring, and then it slaps a couple of extra steps onto here because we're doing verification now. We added a test harness. So, but you can see sort of walking through this, what it does is, you know, it stands up whatever the sort of, and it starts off very, you know, uh, how to say it, uh, almost formalistic, right? Uh, establish a connection, right? Whether uh, you know, between whatever the instances happen to be, you can see some bindings and so on to OpenShift. Deploying OpenShift operators becomes part of this and literally updating our NIC as we go, right? So these things start to come in and you can follow, you know, in, when you're in design mode, you can follow this to, you know, what was the logic for binding them. But overall, we basically establish, you know, the infrastructure we're going to work with, deploy the specific elements, right? So you can see, you know, we're talking about a control plane, we're talking about a firewall. So these generic kind of operations are at a high level, you know, already being sort of penciled in for us. Uh, when we're in design, we can add additional steps. We can look at the workflows behind them and so on. Um, but what's nice is though, this was out of the box. I didn't have to change anything. It understood that, you know, there was uh, uh, optimizations available. So include them, et cetera, um, right down to the point of even deploying the test harness and understanding, okay, we're going to need to push a test plan. So this was all based on the policies and everything else that were created. So this all went into that catalog and it, you know, is sort of now ready for deployment. Um, there's some other things that are worth showing, right? The relationships to some of the components that would actually be installed here, uh, any interfaces that might actually go along with this, right? So it's generating MEF and Etsy based interfaces along the way so that I could, yeah, when we talk about working with the standards, we're even in a lot of cases, just, you know, standing up in a kind of zero touch manner, uh, a complete, you know, uh, implementation on the other side of the standard, right? A VNFM or a network service orchestrator, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, of course you could deploy this through uh, UI or what have you, but right now I'm going to shift now from the kind of almost develop, like we looked at the uh, results of what we did uh, leading up to day one. So the, the day zero stuff, now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to actually do the deployment of this, right? So I'm going to go ahead and actually uh, use a, a simple webhook API that we, we stood up for the test bed, right? So it's a really simple little REST API you know, calling it instantiate with the last, uh, you know, the last service that we had there. So already what we're gonna get is, okay, you know, half a second, it's already starting to deploy. We can see that here, it's allocating. If we jump into, uh, where is it? If we jump into the deployment, you can see, you know, all these components are being set up, whatever the pods are, which include like their operators and the uh, actual components themselves. And we did this through a sort of, like you can even, you know, modify the workflow that you're gonna have for how it's gonna install these into OpenShift, all that kind of good stuff. But what we have now is, already a service that's sort of ready to be consumed, if you want to call it that, right, or used. So uh, if I jump back into eWeb, you know, and all of this is kind of real time, you know, it all refreshes as you go, or, you know, if you're looking at something that's, you know, stale, a couple of seconds old, and you're impatient, refresh it, right? Pulls the latest state down from all the components, including things like even the VDUs, right, across it, right, including, you know, what, uh, what was the actual target domain, you know, uh, where is it here? Um, uh, statuses, what slice it was actually assigned to out of the, the set, all that kind of stuff um, links out to, you know, enjoying the services themselves. Um, but I'm going to just sort of pause and, and show you now what it actually did, right? So we saw there was that high level deployment plan. Um, now, the, the truth is, though, even that plan, when it comes to the detail level, you know, becomes something that's uh, contextualized, right? We have our API hooked, so the system's tracking every event that comes across this service, um, and then it's drilling into the, the detail below it. So when I want to look at that, that event, so what happened when I ran that instantiate command, right, what we can do is we can see here uh, what that actual plan uh, sort of manifested itself in, right, from, you know, pulling the plan itself to, you know, we interacted with OpenShift, so, you know, we deployed a, you know, push to secret so that we could work with it, right? Creating service accounts and whatever else was required. Um, the kind of Etsy stuff, you know, we, we created our network service identifier, calculated our graph, the kinds of things that we have to do, um, you know, resolve the networks that we were gonna work in, uh, deployed the particular components um, themselves, started to create subnets. Um, and I won't go into the, the detail here is gonna just, you know, blow your mind at some point, but right down to, you know, can put, uh, it really meeting the requirements of this, which is deploying all the VDUs, the networks, and eventually at the end, you know, configuring the components themselves and eventually even configuring the NIC, right? So getting to the point of actually uh, you know, putting in those first optimizations 
and then releasing the service, right? So we did a lot in that, you know, span of whatever it was, a couple of seconds, right? Um, and including, you know, standing up the service so we could start to, to use it, right? So I'm going to just sort of review some of the components that were deployed. And I think, again, a lot of this, this detail is worth, you know, diving into separately. But, you know, we set up that video host so we could actually start using the service, right? So uh, I'll show that to you here, right? And this is actually going to be our sort of, uh, our test um, uh, system here, right? So uh, what we're going to look at here, oh, tunnel, sorry, that's the uh, wrong one. That's the, uh, it, it, we are under firewalls there, right? So I can't touch the uh, open shift directly except through the, uh, you know, oops, except through this, you know, the mapped uh, console, but you can see the actual service here, but then I'll just do that again for you. If I go to the service itself, um, you'll see it here, right? It's just an old video that we had from Enterprise Web that's being hosted there and good quality, right? Uh, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't quite matter. It's just that it's a business app that's hosted there um, uh, across this um, uh, 5G core. Uh, all the core components, of course, are deployed and all running and including, you know, management even of their operators, right? So, and you talked earlier about what if, you know, something goes down. Well, there's, there's the healing aspect that, just if one of these gets wiped out, the operator will handle, you know, standing back up. There's some sort of uh, different levels of the, the kind of resilience that's built in here. That's all good. When we're talking about healing, we're talking about the bigger things, right? Which I'm going to show you in a second when I do day two, which is, you know, we're under attack. We got to really heal. It, it's got to be a, a higher level thing than just restarting a pod. So um, I'll show you that in a second, but we have all the, the Aether components. Um, eventually, there's a lot of them. Uh, eventually, you'll actually see the application controller from eWeb that was deployed down there. It becomes part of the manifest. KX components that we're not utilizing in this uh, demo, but are part of the, the package. Key site agents that were needed. And then, of course, the uh, Fortinet, right? So uh, we can even pop into the Fortinet itself, right? So again, deployed as part of the solution. Um, and, you know, you'll see it's, uh, you know, it really hasn't done much of anything right um, cpus are all you know hardly any usage anything like that but it's deployed as part of that solution right so we've got this overall network service that's been deployed now um, we could start using it as we saw a moment ago now what i want to do for the actual demo here is i'm going to turn on so i'm going to go use the uh, apis that you saw there right um, i've got a, a simple api for actually turning on um, the key site component let me let me log into key site so you can see this live it's worth doing here, right? Um, so if I go into Keysight, you'll see that it deployed an app mix and an attack session. It just basically what it did was it loaded into Keysight um, a profile for both uh, attacking this thing and um, it, you know just for uh, application load. So simulate a whole, uh, you know, uh, I'll show you the results in a minute, but uh, 10,000 current users at uh, whatever it was, one gigabyte per second traffic so that we could see how this thing was actually gonna work. All right, so I wanna do that. And what you'd sort of expect is that that might trigger events, which is what it's certainly going to do once we turn the policies on. But at the beginning, we're not gonna see any of that. All we're gonna see is, you know, uh, we start some traffic here. So let's go ahead and do that, all right? So that should start the traffic over on uh, Cyperf, right? So we'll go back in, all right? So, okay, test is configuring, that's good, right? Um, the test is starting, right? So. Um, Okay, test is running, right? So now what we'd expect here is that if we go back to that video service, right? Um, and because this thing is now under attack, right? Where were we? Um, what we're gonna see is that, you know, the quality's not good, right? Uh, I don't even know where to, to start with this, but really we, we just, at that level, it's impossible to use, right? So what we wanna do now is actually go in and we wanna turn on um, at least, you know, we'll turn on them one at a time, right? So we had two policies. One was for scaling and one was for healing, right? The healing one, uh, which I'll, I'll do right now, is uh, we called it um, uh, the uh, gate, basically I'm saying activate gateway, but really what it's doing is it's saying, you know, pay attention to the signals coming in from Fortinet about the attack, right? So it takes a couple of seconds to, you know, to recognize them on the Fortinet side. And the other si side of it is that, uh, you know, it, this is a real simulation, right? So we don't know what traffic is coming in at what time exactly, but at some point, and you can see it's pretty quick, we've got this SLA threshold violation, right? We've got a healing event that actually gets raised in the system and it comes down to, you know, detecting that there's a video quality fault, looking up whatever the resolution happens to be, figuring out that, okay, it's traffic path. If we prioritize the traffic and otherwise we do the, um, 
uh, what do you call it, um, uh, application um, dedicated queues or whatever, uh, which we could configure on the NIC, uh, it's probably going to fix it, right? And we can, of course, well, it does fix it, but um, let's go ahead and actually uh, check out that service again, right? So it's, I can make it out. It's not great, it's, but it's better, right? Uh, the, as far as mediating the sort of threat goes, um, we've done that. Now, the thing is for the second use case, right, or the second day zero operation, which was scaling, and to know, right, this is... Um, it, you know, th there may be more events, which you can see there's a few more healing, right? This is continuously optimizing what's happening down at the NIC, right? Uh, now, though, we want to mix in, of course, like scaling, right? Uh, which is going to be the, um, I don't know what you would call it, like the next thing, right? So let's go ahead and actually activate that. Um, so let's enable scaling. And then same story, right? Uh, what we're gonna find is that at some point, uh, scale out, so it's recognized immediately, right? System need to scale this thing out. So again, a, a fault, a different kind of fault, uh, the re remediation is to increase capacity. So what we're gonna see now is two things, right? Um, if we just go back into the system and requery what's actually deployed there, we're gonna see, okay, we've got two hosts, right? The new video host was put up at a certain time and now of course our traffic, or let's just make sure, um, is sort of back to original quality, right? So the effect of both of those um, uh, day two operations is pretty profound. So uh, that's that's the demo itself, right? And now what I'm gonna do is just review quickly a couple of the benchmarks there. And uh, you know, hopefully that uh, the demo itself, uh, you know, it captured really the, the power of what it is that we're doing here. So as far as the back end of this goes, right? What we did was we, sent to that um, the service, right? So we, we stood up the service itself and we had it automated, you know, deploying and um, uh, measure how long it took and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but the actual findings is that we sent, uh, we, we used SciPerf to simulate a thousand users at one gigabyte per second. And we did things like we turned the attack traffic on and off and so on so that we could measure A and B. And what we found is that, you know, at scale, you know, so at that kind of scale, we're looking at 143 microseconds. And then when it's under attack, it only goes up by about 15% as far as the latency goes. Um, and we were able to look at those, you know, and, you know, those look pretty good to us as far as benchmarks go, we'll, you know, let others decide. But um, the other measures that were good for us were things like the attack success was very low and even to, and this can be broken down even more. What that means is when there was a successful attack, it just meant that things like connections didn't happen. Uh, we were still blocking whatever the sort of uh, malicious uh, content was that was coming in. So it was a good finding. Um, and then our consumption was very low. Uh, it, with, this is to complete the, the entire sort of suite of the uh, service itself, including any of the management components, the monitoring, everything else uh, was a pretty good um, use. And we found that this was actually 20% of the uh, sort of, uh, or sorry, 20% less than just deploying uh, the one specific Aether component itself uh, on dedicated hardware and sort of a standalone. So we got a lot of advantages from porting it into OpenShift and the other things that we did here. Um, as far as power goes, there was a, a great, um, uh, you know, we found a great result with the NIC optimization. We turned, basically, we just ran this under attack uh, with the optimizations on and off, as you saw. And we found that, you know, the, when we were continuously optimizing the NIC, uh, the power consumption actually went down 26%. Um, and then there was, uh, you know, the, a few other sort of sl smaller findings, but just th full throughput was the uh, major um, performance uh, indicator, right? Uh, how much uh, bandwidth we could, you know, uh, the process at a time. And then uh, what was nice is for the implementation, it was, which was just, uh, was done by one FTE. It was about 19 hours to implement this entire thing. If you don't count the, um, you know, uh, coordination between actors. Uh, so between the partners and so on. Um, and then as far as day one, day two operations, they all came out very, uh, you know, including things like creating independent slices and so on. Uh, all of our numbers were really, um, you know, split second in terms of uh, actual calculation and you know, execution of a plan. Uh, and then it was really just a matter of, you know, uh, time to detection and uh, even times to provision were all pretty low because of the, you know, using things like the OpenShift operators and all the other kinds of uh, standards that were in there. Um, so I, that, yeah, I'm, I'm back to the, uh, that completes my point. So thank you very much. And I'm going to give the uh, f floor back to Dave. To, uh, hey Tom, I see you there. I know we ran over uh, just quickly before we go to Q and A, just want to make sure I thank everybody for attending uh, before people drop off. Uh, there's my email address. If anybody wants to reach out.
Uh, we welcome uh, interest in private demos or uh, trials. Uh, uh, all the partners uh, appreciate your time here. Uh, there's going to be some the next step for this test bed is to add the observability and AI ML integration uh, for the song that I mentioned. Fortinet is going to be also uh, adding some advanced 5G security capabilities. He said it's going to be doing more uh, on energy consumption testing. And we are going to integrate IPDK. <coughs> the, uh, excuse me. So uh, I'll take a drink of uh, coffee while Tom you feel some questions. All right. Hey, good job, Bill. I uh, I, I always worry uh, when we have uh, live demos, they can be uh, fraught with peril, but that went quite well.